and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Ruthie, can we have the roll call, please? Chairman Lynch. Present. Councillor Backer. Here. Councillor Dill. Councillor Lennon. Councillor McKenney. Here. Councillor Rowe. Here. And Councillor Swinkiata. Here. Okay, the next item on our agenda is um, approval of the minutes of uh, Monday, July 14th. Is there a motion? David? I move the approval of the minutes of our regular meeting number 13-2008, dated Monday, July 14, 2008. Second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Show that to be 5-0. And um, <clears throat> now it's time for reports and correspondence. Um, before we get to any, I did just want to um, make mention uh, of B2B, and it would be hard to be in Cape Elizabeth and, and not uh, observe that wonderful um, road race. But I think it's important just to um, thank um, many people that were involved. There were hundreds of volunteers, Cape Elizabeth citizens, who were involved in putting that race forward and um, a number of municipal employees um, that have to work very hard to make that possible including the fire department, the police department, our rescue, um, engine one and engine two, um, the fire police, the wet team, public works of course works very hard setting up and um, cleaning up. And then, um, in addition, we have help from a number of towns, and I'm not sure how much people are aware of that, and we just really appreciate the um, intergovernmental cooperation. So I just wanted to mention that this year we had help from the town of Cumberland, Falmouth, Gorham, Portland, Scarborough, South Portland, Wyndham, Oxford, and Old Orchard Beach, and many of those um, towns provide uh, fire and rescue and police personnel and other personnel to make the race possible. There's no way that a small town like Cape Elizabeth could host B2B without the help of those surrounding communities. So I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to thank not just the volunteers in Cape Elizabeth, but also the many volunteers that we have um, from other communities um, and from the bank, um, but also those fire and rescue and police from our community and other communities. So just wanted to mention that. Paul? Thank you. I just wanted to give you a, a, an update on the Greater Portland Council of Governments. We've been pretty active over the last year, and I thought it would be timely to let you know what's going on. We had our annual meeting in June, and our, my good friend Jim Rowe attended. And that, it was really nice to see him there. We had a, a great turnout. And what we've done is we're really focusing on sustainability planning moving forward. Um, and that's going to be the big push uh, for GPCOG in terms of working with our member communities. Uh, we added South Portland and Shabig Island as new members. And um, we have not, uh, our, our dues for GPCOG have remained constant per capita for 19 consecutive years. So that we've done a really good job with, well, I shouldn't say I've done a really good job, but the, the staff, the executive director of GPCOG have done a great job in terms of managing resources wisely. Uh, we're going to take a delegation to Nova Scotia here very shortly, actually this week. Uh, it involves the uh, Greater Portland Council of Government Steering Committee, uh, members of the Portland Regional Chamber, uh, a couple of representatives from the Muskie School, at USM and a representative from Cumberland County, one of the county commissioners. And what we're going to do is go to Yarmouth uh, Regional Government and Halifax Regional Government and see what they're doing up there, uh, establish new ties, learn from them, and take back ideas that we can use and perhaps implement regionally here in terms of regional uh, cooperation and collaboration. And while we're there, we're going to also visit the Tidal Power Station on Fundy Bay to see if there's anything that's applicable to our region. Uh, 
Also, this year we joined a, uh, an organization called ICLE, and what it is is Governments for Sustainability. It really has to do with energy, um, and what that does is gives all our member communities, 26 communities in this region, access to all of the resources from this organization in terms of uh, figuring out how to become more efficient, more energy efficient, and uh, it's, it should be serve as a very useful tool. Uh, one of the uh, things that we just did, uh, Maine Clean Communities, uh, one of the staff members from GP Cog heads up Maine Clean Communities, and we just had a display of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Maybe members of the community got to see this, but we had them at Fort Williams Park yesterday, and this morning I was able to attend a, a news conference that had a, several dignitaries and all the cars, there are nine manufacturers working on these. And these cars, um, they have a range, the range uh, varies, but they have BMWs, Honda, uh, GM and Ford are in it, um, Kia, you name it. And I, one of the cars that I looked at had a range of up to 280 miles, 74 miles per gallon, zero emissions. And what they're doing, these cars are going to drive 4,000 miles. They're going to um, drive down to North Carolina and then across to California. And what they're demonstrating is that these hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are, they're practical in terms of um, what they can do. They can drive just like a, a regular car. Difference is they don't use any gasoline and, um, and they don't emit any emissions if, they, if they're using the fuel cell. Um, the point is that we don't have the infrastructure built yet, but the Department of Energy is working on infrastructure development across the nation in terms of changing current stations and, and seeing what we can do. So, so it's pretty exciting, and it's really exciting that it started right here, um, you know, the, the travel, and it actually the first uh, demo was right here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, one other item is um, we've recently become an economic development district, um, and the Metro Regional Coalition, which CAPE is a, a founding member of, is working on developing an economic development organization in this area. And the, our, one of our first major projects is to build a biotech park in uh, Westbrook that should provide about 1,000 high-paying biotech jobs in the next 10 years. So that's an update. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. There are other reports or correspondence. Michael, town manager's report. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman Marion. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Just wanted to bring everyone up to date on Spurwink Avenue and what's going on. The main department of transportation and a local and a, and a contractor that they have hired has been working on paving the section from uh, the Spurwink Church down to uh, the, the power substation uh, on Spurwink. That work is nearly complete. Complete. They've been waiting to paint the lines. However, the rain has uh, necessitated delaying that a number of times. Uh, they, they really only have a couple of days left work. There's a tiny bit of guardrail to go in, and there's, there's those, uh, those lines. And as soon as those are in, that should be done. The section that extends from the power substation to Perputa Club is a, is a town project with, without any state or federal dollars. Uh, and it, the, the reason for that is because if, if it was done with federal and state dollars, it would have to be built to the federal standards, which would mean taking out the tops of the hill, which would mean moving back the ledge, taking out tons of ledge. It was about a $4 million project. Uh, instead, the town's just, the public works have been fixing the shoulders, uh, and we'll, we'll just, we're just going to be shimming it and paving it for a cost of uh, probably in the range of 70000 uh, versus the $4 million. So. Anyway, uh, that work should be done, weather permitting, by around the end of the month. Uh, so if anyone wondered what's going on with those projects, uh, they're, they're expecting to be done. The other thing, every year in the town report, we look at town statistics. And I thought it'd be interesting to look at a few of them in 1990, the year 2000, and also 2008. And for example, births, the three years around 1990, they averaged about 81 a year. The last three years, it's been 62, 61, 61. So we're, we're, we're virtually down about 20 births uh, 
compared to what we were getting, you know, back to, uh, back in 1990, almost 17 years ago, or about the time, you know, to look at it from school, for you know, school purposes, just births alone, which has it has a little bit to do with school population, but not totally, because there's not a lot of in-migration. It's, it's a drop of about 20 births on average each year now compared to what it was when the, the graduating seniors uh, were, were born. Uh, marriages are way down, but from 166 in 1990 to 43 in 2008. Uh, but that has somewhat to do with changes in law and the way you, you, you get a marriage license. Uh, you, you no longer have to go to a couple of different town halls. You can do it much easier than, than the past. So uh, less revenue, but uh, just as many marriages, perhaps. Uh, new single family home construction. The last two years total, there's been 24 homes built. 10 in the fiscal year that ended a year ago, and 14 this past year. That 24 over two years, if you look at all the years we've kept track of, we've been keeping track of the statistic over the previous 18 years, the low for any given year was 23. So in the last two years, we've met the low for, for the last 18 years, uh, you know, even combining the two years together. That, by the way, it was fiscally year 1999 when we had 23 homes built. Uh, police arrest, for those that are concerned about those things. In 1990, we had 103. The year that ended June 30, we had 96. Summonses, for those that see the, the, the blue lights at the side of the road. In 1990, there were 929. In the 12 months just ended, there were 492. Uh, rescue calls this past year were 477. So there was, there was a little better chance of getting a police summons than there was of needing the rescue. Parking tags, for those that, that uh, have been unhappy about some of those, we, in the year 2000, we had 480. In the year 1990, 446. This past year, 111. So th those of you that, that got a parking ticket were extremely unlucky. Uh, <laughs> fire calls been averaging 270, 271, both in 2000 and 2008. Interesting, almost the same. Vehicle accidents, 118 last year. Uh, on the roads of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, public safety training hours. Th these are our fire, police, uh, our wet team, our engine companies. Back in 1990, there were 6,300 hours. This past year, there were 13,000 hours. And I don't think many other communities could look at their public safety volunteers and see a, you know, a doubling of it since uh, 1990. Uh, you know, I think pretty significant. Moorings, uh, these are the moorings particularly off uh, Crescent, also down at Maiden Cove. We've gone from 80 in town to 103. So, you know, a few more boaters. Some of that gets, when the economy gets a little bit tougher, folks like moorings a little bit better than they like docking it at a marina because of the, the added expense of docking at a marina. Tons of recycling. In the year 2000, there were 2,100 tons. This past year, there were 4,800 tons. It's more than doubled. Solid waste, the, what goes into the hopper at the transfer station. In 1990, it was 3,700. This past year, it was 3,275. So that's, that's showing uh, declines. Miles of town road have gone up about six, from 56 to 62 from 1990. Library circulation, 103,000 to 138,000, up mm -hmm. 35,000 since 1990. The, the other uh, planning board agenda items, I see the town planner in the audience, there were 62 in 1990, and there were 27 in fiscal year 2008. And zoning board agenda items, this, is, this I really find interesting. 42 in 1990, 21 exactly half in the year 2000, and in 2008, there were only three. So if you see notice of zoning board meetings being canceled every month, that's the reason, is that there only were three appeals that came in last year. And part of that is because of a lot less construction, but part of it is as the ordinances have changed and understanding of them. So I thought you might find some of those of interest. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. It was, and I know that you've got a very interesting report also at the end of the meeting. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a presentation from Nancy Marshall, who is on the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees. And Nancy is going to give us an update on the Library Study Committee.
And I will move out of the way, Nancy. Okay. Uh, there I am. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Mary Ann. Uh, I'm very happy to be here t tonight to uh, bring you up to date on the work of the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee. Um, just as a beginning, over on the left you see the Thomas Memorial Library around uh, 1950. And the reason we know that is because the bobby socks that the women are wearing. And then on the right is Pine Cove Annex uh, around 1920 and in the center, the Thomas Memorial Library, as you see it today. In April of 1919, Thomas, William Woodry Thomas Jr. dedicated the Thomas Memorial Library and in his dedication, he challenged the community of Cape Elizabeth to keep the light of the library burning forever. And the town has done a wonderful job in that. And we are, I believe, embarking on another great uh, segment to keep the light burning in the library for the, for the community. Um, the library study committee is made up of the seven members of the board of trustees. Uh, I am the chair, Edna Doe is the secretary. Jay Sherman, the library director, acts as ex officio. We have Pat Breedenberg, Robert Chatfield, Penny Olson, Nancy O'Sullivan, and Evan Roth. The <clears throat> town council representative is Ann Smith Kayata, the representative from the Historical Society, uh, Norman Jordan, and the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation had a representative. She recently resigned from the foundation. So that slot is uh, recently vacated, but the foundation believes that because Ed and I wear a hat on the foundation as well as on the um, study committee, <clears throat> that we can represent the interests of the foundation as well as the study committee news back to them. So this is our committee. Uh, the town council charged the study committee with the following define a library program to serve the needs of the community for the next 30 years, develop a proposal and conceptual plan for improvements to library facilities, recommend a funding plan for any proposed improvements, and select a consultant to help us in that process. November 5, 2007 was when the town council created the uh, study committee. We put an RFP out on the street nationally in the early part of March. Uh, while we were waiting for responses to come in, uh, we had a deadline of March 28th. The study committee went to four different libraries in the state and looked at, uh, these were recently renovated or recently built libraries. We were anxious to see what they had done. We were anxious to talk with them about what they would have do differently and what they wished they had done differently. And so we got a lot of nice information from those trips. We received seven responses to our RFP uh, by the end of March. And in uh, April, we began to interview the three selected firms. They came to Cape Elizabeth on their own dime. Uh, we selected a firm, Himmel and Wilson, in May. Um, the town council accepted the funding proposal for the uh, study and authorized a contract to be written with the consultants. That was done in June. Um, the middle of July, we had a kickoff visioning session here to which many of you came on the, on the town council. And the manager, town manager was there and the study committee. And it was a four hour session. And then last week, the consultants were here for four days and conducted 10 focus groups, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. These are our consultants. Himmel and Wilson are from um, Milton, Wisconsin. As they say, it's halfway between Madison and O'Hare, so that's why they like it down there. Um, they have been 21 years as library consultants. They've consulted with over 300 libraries. Uh, they were librarians, and they are librarians and they have programmed tens 
and hundreds of thousands of square feet of public library space. They have brought into their team two architects from Casaccio Architects. They are in Haverton, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. It's a small firm, uh, Lee Casaccio on the left. His father started the firm 58 years ago, and his daughter is studying architecture, so I think the, it will stay with the firm. It's small as, as architectural firms go, but it gives them the opportunity to work closely with their, um, with their contractees and give us the kind of design that we would like. On the right is Kevin Whitney. Kevin was born in Raymond, Maine. His parents are still there, and he actually lived in Cape Elizabeth for several years when he was working for an architectural firm in Portland, so he's delighted to be back in Maine, and we're delighted to have him. And the fifth member of that team is Linda Miller. She's out of Rockford, Illinois. She is the president and owner of one of uh, only a handful of firms in the United States that specialize in library technology. So there are three phases to the library study. The needs assessment, an improvement program, and a conceptual plan. And after each phase, there'll be a draft report, and then there will be a final report. Now, the town council has given us a deadline of May 1st, 2009, but the study committee imposed its own deadline of January 1, 2009. If we slip a little bit, that'll be okay, because we still have plenty of time. But we thought that we didn't need to drag it out, and so we are aiming for January 1st, 2009. So the needs assessment, and we are deeply into the needs assessment phase right at the moment. What the consultants have done is gather a lot of statistical data about the library and a lot of demographics about the community. We had the visioning session. We had the focus groups where the main focus of the focus groups was to find out what people thought about and how they regarded current library services, programs, staffing, the adequacy of the library collections, and the adequacy of the library facility. The focus groups covered the waterfront, in the best of our uh, imagination, from preschool parents all the way up to seniors, high school students, middle school students, town council, the business and professional community, the foundation, friends of the library, historical, society, senior citizens, general library users, and of course, the library staff. We're going to have some additional survey instruments. There's going to be a randomly uh, selected telephone survey, and there will also be an online survey through the Thomas Memorial website, Thomas Memorial Library website. <clears throat> the consultants have also held several one-on-one -on -one interviews with town officials and with members of the study committee. And they will be holding a town meeting. We're not sure exactly when. We think maybe now, in the, in the beginning we thought we'd have it at the end of the needs assessment, but now we think it will be towards the end of this phase two when they have more to be able to show the community of what they're thinking about in terms of implementing the needs that have shown up during the assessment. So, based on all of this data that they're collecting and have collected now, they're going to give us recommendations for improving library services, finances, collections, staffing over the next 10 years, and we've told them we need cost estimates with that, and also library space needs for the near term and for the next 30 years, just in case we have to break it up. So the phase two is the improvement program. Based on what they have learned in the needs assessment phase, they're going to address the space and storage issues needed to carry out the improvements in the library program. And so they are going to be looking at space for every age group for the li in the library that use the library, the staff functions, the collections, both print, non-print, the library technologies, and the community uses, 
which we already have, but which we can certainly increase, such as the book sales, lectures in the library, art displays, and an issue that we really need to look at, the Cape Elizabeth historical records. So at the end of phase two, they're going to prepare a draft plan with cost estimates for three alternative options. Should we renovate the current structure? Should we look at construction of new space in addition to renovation? Shall we replace the current library? And I suppose there is a fourth option, which is do nothing. But that's not really too high on anyone's agenda, I hope. But in all of these scenarios, we have to look at the viability of the two historical buildings in the planning process. The third phase is the conceptual plan. And based on the approved reports from phases one and two, in phase three, the consultants will propose a conceptual plan for any improvements they will submit preliminary schematic, schematic floor plans for the favored alternative of those three and will recommend a funding plan, including suggestions for potential of both public and private funding. And when we say schematic floor plans, that's just very elemental. That is certainly not detailed architectural drawings at all, just to give us all a picture of what from these other phases, it looks like the Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth community is interested in having. And then we have a final report. And once it's reviewed by the study committee, it's going to be presented to the town, town council and to the Cape Elizabeth community for comments. So what are we trying to do? We are building a bridge between the past and the future in Cape Elizabeth. And even though these bridges are not in Cape Elizabeth, as you all know. The one on the left is the Waldo Hancock Bridge, built in 1929. The one on the right, right next to it, basically, is the Penobscot Narrows Bridge, opened in 2006. Towns Memorial Library has experienced considerable change since its dedication on April 22, 1919. And if you look real closely, William Widgery is in the back row, right under the flagpole with the big beard. Books didn't look much different in 1919 than they do today. These two titles from that year, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, still being read. I don't know if anyone's reading Dangerous Days, but Mary Roberts Reinhardt is still a well-known author. But libraries in that time have changed dramatically, and the public library of today is a place to gather, a place to grow, a place to know, a place to learn, and most importantly, a center of community life. Based on we know, what we know about William Widgery Thomas Jr., and he was a very global person, we can surmise that he would be excited at the prospect of his little lighthouse serving as this bridge to the world. And that, as you will recognize, is the old Spurwink School before it was the public library. And some of the questions that he might ask, and the study committee is certainly dealing with these questions, as well as many others. How do you design an information bridge between the past and the future? What should the scope, how large should the services offered include? What criteria do we need to make these kinds of decisions? And how large should an expanded or a new library be to meet the needs of the Cape Elizabeth community? The study committee believes that with Himmel and Wilson and with their uh, other members of their team, we have an excellent group of people to help us find the answers to these and other questions. I think one of the things that sold the study committee on the team was the philosophy that they have that they do not see their roles as telling us the library, the study committee, the people as a community, what kind of a library we need. They see their role is to help us determine the kind of library we want based on our understanding of what a 20th first century library can be. So this is our past, the old Spurwink School again, before it became the library. 
So the question that's up to us to answer is, what will our library bridge to the future be like? Several years ago, the library had a little contest with young members of the community, and they asked the community students, little young children, what they thought about the library. And Chris Rochebeau, who was nine at the time, said, I think the Thomas Memorial Library is the best place in the whole wide world. It's better than a candy store, by far. What a genius he was. <laughs> so this is the end of the show. It's a new beginning for the library. And I just have one more slide. We all recognize all of these places as very special to our community. And the next time I give a, I give a show, I'm going to put a schematic of the New Thomas Memorial Library up there for you all to see. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Nancy. Any questions? Are there any questions for Nancy? I Thank think uh, because a lot of us have been to the various vision and, yes, you have. and right. focus and groups, probably some of our questions have been answered. Uh, but we do appreciate all the work that the committee is doing. And we're excited and look forward to seeing your work product Thank you. sometime between January and May. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe something before that, too. Thank you, Nancy. And please thank the rest of the committee for us. OK, the next item on the agenda is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So if anyone is here and would like to speak to an issue that is not on our agenda, now is um, the time to do that, although we also will have time at the end of our meeting as well. And seeing nobody, we will move to item 111, which is this school budget. Now, I see a lot of people here. I don't know if anyone cares to uh, speak to this tonight. Um, we have on our agenda a motion, a proposed motion to set this for public hearing next Monday, for next Monday night. Um, if anyone wishes to speak tonight, um, our rules permit a total of 15 minutes um, for everyone who wishes to speak. Obviously, next week, when we have a public hearing, um, we don't have that um, time constraint. So um, if there is anyone who would like, who's here and would like to speak to item 111, um, now is the time to do that. And seeing none, we will just move to the item and our discussion of it. Um, is there a motion before that we can discuss? Thank you, Jim. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd like to make just a couple comments on the budget in general, if I could, uh, being the chairman of the Finance Committee. Uh, I don't think any uh, or very few of us in this room felt that this budget process was going to be an easy one back in February, March, April, and it certainly hasn't disappointed. Um, it's, it's been probably bumpier than Sproink Avenue, uh, but as we are approaching the middle of August here now and, and the beginning of September to follow, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to smooth out the bumps in that road. Um, and I, I seriously look forward to, to that happening. So with that said, uh, I would like to make uh, actually four motions. Um, I was looking to see if I could combine them, but I think I we I think we should do them one at a time. I, I do too. So I would first move um, that a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2009 school budget be held on Monday, August 18th, 2008 at 7.30 p.m., following which the Town Council will consider the recommendation of the Cape Elizabeth School Board for a 5.3% expenditure increase in the school budget for fiscal year 2009 from the budget, uh, budget level of this year. Is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Three, four, five, zero. Okay. One for one. Uh, I would also move that on August 18, 2008, the Town Council uh, approve a revised school budget 
and authorize a budget validation vote to occur on Tuesday, September 2nd, 2008. Okay. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Great. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> My third motion. Um, I would move that the town council request the town manager to work with his staff to immediately begin accepting applications for absentee ballots, to have absentee ballots ready for voting on August 19th, 2008, to provide that the tax commitment will occur on September 3rd, 2008, pursuant to the school consolidation law and the assessment statutes of the state of Maine, and to have October 2nd, 2008 as the first of two tax due dates for fiscal year 2009, with the second being on April 2nd, 2009. Second. Discussion? All in favor? 5-0. And finally, um, I would move that the ballot for the validation vote also include an advisory question on the ballot, similar to that that appeared on the two previous budget validation votes, uh, asking if the budget uh, as proposed is too high or too low. Okay, is there second. a second? Second. Discussion? David. The, the question that keeps popping up is whether or not there should be a third option and whether there should be a, not a just right, but reasonably acceptable or some other some third option for people who want to who want to vote yes and still fill in another circle <laughs> i mean there's no reason why somebody can't vote yes and leave the yes or no alone that's still an option but i think that there is a sense that people want to be able to do more than just vote yes or no they want to vote yes and then go on to the next one so the uh, suggestion is that there be some third option to add. Do you have a suggestion for specific too high, wording? Too low or acceptable? Reasonably acceptable or ac just acceptable. Acceptable. I'd accept that. <laughs> As do I. <laughs> An acceptable As do I. amendment. So As do I. we will. We'll take that as an amendment to your motion. You want that in the I middle? Want it. That would be in the middle. In the middle. I think. Too high. Too high. Acceptable. Acceptable. Too, too low. low. Okay. The order. The order is indifferent to me. Probably important. Flip a coin, I suppose, too. But. Okay. Further discussion. Seeing none. Uh, uh, I, I just have a question. Yes. I just want to make sure I know what the motion is. Um, the motion is to include an advisory question on the ballot. Um, and the, the three options would be too high, acceptable, and too low. That, that I find with this, the same line before that that was on the previous ballots, I find the, the, the budget as presented. You want to read that? Whatever the yeah. wording is. Would you like me to? Would you please read yeah. it. I we find we the, have the draft, sure. so. Uh, it will read, I find the school budget adopted at the August 18, 2008 Town Council school budget meeting to be too high, and then a spot to fill in, is it filling an oval now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Acceptable, a spot to fill in an oval, and too low at an oval. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to okay. make sure. So, and the staff is clear on what it will say, and we're clear, so. No further discussion? All in favor? 5-0. Okay. Well, I will, we will move to item 112, and we have a public hearing on um, amendments to the comprehensive plan. And I don't know if people are staying for that. If you're not, I would ask that you clear the room quickly so that we can continue our work. Thank you.
Okay. I'm going to open up the public hearing on item 112, which is the proposed technical amendments to the comprehensive plan. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to the um, issue of the technical amendments to the comprehensive plan? Going once, going twice, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Okay. And now um, it is up to the council to um, discuss this. Do we have a motion? I'm Mary Ann. Yes, Ann. I move that uh, we approve the technical amendments to the comprehensive plan as outlined in the memo from the town planner that is dated June 26, 2008. Second motion. Okay. And Maureen, thank you for that nice red-lined version of the amendments. Uh, I don't know what I would have done on Sunday if I had to figure this out without your red line. So thank you very much for taking the time to put that together. Further discussion? All in favor? Five zero. OK. The next item on our agenda is um, a report from the Ordinance Committee. And uh, Cynthia is not here. Um, I guess I'll just read it for her. Um, the Ordinance Committee um, has, uh, I guess, worked on the um, proposed amendments to uh, Fort Williams. And those amendments include updating penalty provisions um, and included uh, changes for procedures for weddings over 20 people, for commercial filming permits, a smoking ban, and increased penalties for not following regulations. And um, it is recommended that this be set for public hearing on September 8, 2008, at 7.30 at our regular meeting. So that's the report. Sorry. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? 5-0. Okay. <clears throat> Item 114 is proposed amendments to the floodplain management ordinance. I don't know, um, Michael, if that's something that you were going to speak to. i just briefly say that the Ordinance Committee reviewed this extensively and made no changes from okay. the earlier draft. And, and have also recommended that this be set for public hearing on September 8th at 7.30. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? 5-0. We're moving right along here. Okay. Um, item 115 is a... Um, proposed revision to town council rules and one of our goals this year was to um, develop greater protocols for responding to citizen comments and with that goal in mind the town manager had um, has redrafted the town council rules he and I have had um, several discussions over the summer about this and what we'd like what I'd like to propose is that we create a subcommittee of the previous town council chair, if you will agree to serve, myself as the current chair, and the finance committee chair. And this subcommittee would take a look at the rules and then report back to us, um, presumably at the September meeting, but there's no great urgency. It could be October, depending on the committee's schedule. So um, I guess I would just like to move, um, if that's acceptable, um, that you authorize me to appoint those three councillors. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you. 5-0. The next item is item 116, which is the Maine Municipal Association annual ballot. Um, Ann, do you want to speak to that as a sure. resident MMA sure. person? Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, the since the memo was from me, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I should probably address it. Um, annually, uh, there are elections for positions on the executive committee of the Maine Municipal Association. Um, and this year's nominees are listed 
in your packet. It is proposed by MMA's nominating committee that John Sylvester, who is a selectman in the town of Alfred, be um, elected to be the vice president for a one-year term, and then directors to be elected to three-year terms, proposed by the nominating committee, Mark Green, the town manager of the town of Sanford, Ryan Pelletier, the town manager of the town of St. Agat, and George Richardson, Jr., the chair of selectmen of Westport Island. So I would move that we cast our ballot for the, these folks for um, MMA executive committee members. I second. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you, 5-0. And now, um, what may be the most interesting item on our agenda, not just tonight, but in a long time, the uh, manager is going to spend some time on the annual benchmark study, which he has updated. And uh, I think he had asked me for five or 10 minutes. And I said to him, I think you should take all the time you need, because I think it's an excellent study that Michael puts forth. So I hope you'll all agree with me that five or 10 minutes might not have done it the justice. And I, I think it's a good opportunity for the public at home um, who might be watching to uh, also see this information. And I would just note that it is all on the website, or it will be. It is, it is now. Fine. It is now. So with that, I will um, move out of the center, and uh, Michael can update us. Just, uh, thank you, Chairman Marianne. Before I begin, Ruthie, the MMA, the original ballot, is in the council pending folder. Could you grab it for me? That would be great. Up in the top left drawer, file cabinet. Good. I don't want to forget to have you guys sign that. Anyway, uh, Marianne mentioned the municipal benchmarks. And what, what the municipal benchmarks was on for about 31 pages. And then there's also school benchmarks, which I forget the exact number of pages. But I'm not going to go through them all. What I've, what I've tried to do is put, I think it's about 15 slides together that highlight a few of the benchmarks. Uh, and uh, I'm not. It's not, uh, we're not, the, the rest of them are available online. The specific spot where it is online is if you go through the link on the front page to council packets, it's on the link for tonight's meeting. Uh, you go to council packets and you'll follow it, it's intuitive. It's also in that area of, of the website that's called documents, so uh, the, the full report with all the benchmarks are there. Uh, what I'd like to point out is these are from, primarily from the June 30, 2007 financial statements. Uh, it's also, there's one statistic population, which is the, the July 1, 2007 estimate of the U.S. Census Bureau for the different communities. The only other source that I, that I used was in a couple of places there wasn't enough detail in the financial statements in the municipal budgets. And what I did in that case, I, I found their budgets for this year, and I found what the, what the communities listed as their actuals for these things in that previous year. And what, what I deliberately try not to do is to call the communities and get data independently, because then it, I think it becomes a, a little less rigorous in terms of its conformity from communi community to community. Uh, one thing, you know, you, you look at you know, property values in a, in a community, and valuation per person is taking the state valuation and simply dividing it by that July 1, 2007 population. And you look at this, and I think what's really interesting is, you know, we have the most valuation per person, but the valuation of these other communities also includes business valuation. And, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing, even with no business in Cape Elizabeth, or, excuse me, very little business in Cape Elizabeth, very nice New Jonesies, I recommend it highly. Uh, <laughs> nice and by the sea, but even, you know, with just those few businesses in Cape Elizabeth, uh, compared to, you know, you, you go out to Falmouth Route 1, you see all these places. What this doesn't include, those state valuation, is the tax increment financing stuff that some of the other communities have uh, sheltered from the state valuation. But again, this you know goes into school funding and other issues. It's an important issue. What state valuation is? That it's interesting. At Rotary this past week, Adrian Murphy, who's a local real estate person, spoke and uh, did a very good job. And she indicated that their sales and what they've seen from all, not their sales but all of the sales in in Cape Elizabeth the value is just down 2%. You know, we're seeing a little bit higher than that, but, but interestingly enough, other parts of the state are seeing bigger reductions in value according to her presentation. 
and that's going to be running on the South Portland cable channels at some point, but a very interesting presentation. Uh, Adrian Murphy, local Cape Elizabeth resident, made on, uh, on the different, the, what's going on with the real estate market. If you look at full value tax rate, this is calculated by looking at the amount of the tax commitment and dividing it by the valuation. And you look, you look at this statistic, and Cape Elizabeth has the low, you know, next to Scarborough, which is just a penny less, the lowest full value tax rate in the region. And you look at, you know, the communities we usually compare ourselves to. You know, Falmouth is, is a, a bit above us. Uh, South Portland is a bit, a bit more than a bit. And Yarmouth and Cumberland are, are uh, you know, particularly percentage-wise, you know, uh, they're up, you know, 40% 40, 40 higher than Cape Elizabeth. And that's, you know, the $300,000 home in Cape Elizabeth is paying approximately 1079 and the $300,000 home in Cumberland is paying fifteen fifteen, but pretty significant statistic. But then you go around and you look at tax commitment per person, the actual commitment. And this is, this is taking all of the valuation, both business and residential, and dividing it by the number of people. And it's interesting, while you know, we were at the very bottom with Scarborough, when you look at the tax commitment per person, this is because of the higher property values, the valuations you just saw, we're, we're second uh, to Yarmouth, but you look, we're, we're, we're second to Yarmouth, but we're $500 below Yarmouth. Uh, we're also, you know, a little bit above Falmouth and, uh, you know, fairly predictable. Uh, you know, if, if you're uh, Gorham, it's, you know, we're more than double what the tax commitment is per person in Gorham. Now, this, is, this is, was not in the original benchmark study, and you won't see it on the online section. This is if you take the percentage of property that is residential and is paid by residential properties. They're not necessarily property owners because it can be apartments, for example, are listed as residential property. Uh, there can be houses here in Cape Elizabeth that are residential that are owned by, by uh, someone, you know, even by a business. But it's, as long as it's classified as residential property, you take that portion of the tax commitment that's paid residential, for example, in Cape Elizabeth, 97% is paid by residents. You take 97% of the tax commitment. You do it that way, and it's interesting, you know, Cape Elizabeth, by that standard, has the highest taxes per person uh, compared to these other communities. Mike, does this account for Yarmouth subsidy from Cousins Island? This accounts for all of the residential property in those communities. For example, Cousins Island and Yarmouth, they have the power plant out there. We looked at what their tax was, and that was included. This simply took the balance of the tax commitments that wasn't paid by commercial. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these are really equivalent numbers. Okay, that's what I was trying to These are the really equivalent numbers of what, what the household or what the average person pays. And again, th this isn't per household, this is per person. So, you know, if the average household has two, two folks, uh, you know, it would be 4,600 uh, in tax. And we all know, I think the average tax is actually a little bit higher than that at this point. Uh, what, so that, that's the general taxes. And, you know, I think that the basic message on all that was, is, you know, depending on which way you look at it, you can use the, the statistic that is beneficial to your argument. If you believe taxes are the highest in Cape Elizabeth, there's a, there's a statistic there to show it. If you believe that full value tax rate is what really matters, we're about the lowest uh, around. But, you know, it's, it just shows different, different benchmarks and statistics can show different things. Intergovernmental revenue, this is what you get from the state, the feds. It includes the school subsidy. It includes state revenue sharing. Uh, those, those are the main highlights. 13.8% of everything we spent during the fiscal year that ended June 30, 2007 uh, came from the federal and state government. That compares to 45% in Gorham. Gorham is a very high receiver state school subsidy. Brunswick, interestingly enough, gets a lot of money because of the, the base there. There's, there's a program if you have federal, uh, federal employees, uh, students, uh, kids in your school, you, you get quite a bit of money. But again, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think South Portland residents would be surprised to see that, that they actually get less from the state and federal government, or what they did during that particular year, less than Cape Elizabeth. Uh, 
this is, and, and deliberately in this slideshow, I'm not focusing on education. And the, the education benchmarks were, were available about a month and a half earlier. And, and because I'm, I'm trying not to get involved in the, the give and take of the current, uh, you know, since it's a vote coming up, I'm, I'm, this is excluding education. This is what Cape Elizabeth spends for all services charged to the general fund. That's an important factor. Uh, excluding education. And you see, if you exclude education, you know, Falmouth is spending an awful lot more per person, per capita, on its municipal government than Cape Elizabeth is. So is in Scarborough and Yarmouth. You know, it, this, you know, we're down, you know, with Cumberland, Brunswick, you know, so we're very close to, almost, you know, right on top of South Poland and, and uh, Freeport and Cumberland. We were sort of in a cluster there. The general government is, it involves the expense for the town council, the expense for elections, assessing, codes, planning, all of the financial administration of the town, the town manager, uh, boards and commissions, uh, in the insur miscellaneous insurances, uh, you know, the, the uh, general comprehensive liability and those type things. Uh, what Cape Elizabeth spends is 3.7% of all it spent, both town and school, uh, on general government. Uh, you know, South Portland, for an equivalent benchmark, is spending nearly 12%. Uh, Brunswick is, is 9%. This shows that, you know, as this, and I will mention, the school also shows that their administrative costs, compared to these other communities, are, are on the low end. So, uh, you know, it's when, when we look at how much we're spending, you know, hopefully, you know, some of the other statistics we'll see will show where we're really spending money. Public safety, you know, you look, South Portland, which has, you know, very big police and fire departments compared to most, you know, these suburban communities, is spending a little over 12% of its budget on public safety. We're spending about 6%. Uh, only Wyndham spends less as a percentage of its bu budget on public safety. Why is that? This is, this is the, the real telling piece right here. Our police department, I, I didn't put it up, but that would be on this scale about where Freeport is, of, of where it falls in. But if you look at just fire and rescue, and this is, this is the one place where I added something of our general fund. The rescue fund isn't our general fund, but I added it in just to, to make sure that we were comparing apples to apples. And I knew some of these other communities, it, it was included. But if you include you know, the, the full amount for fire and rescue in Cape Elizabeth, we're spending $45 per person. Scarborough you know, is spending 139 per person. Uh, substantially different. This is, you know, a real credit to the volunteers in our fire department uh, and the rescue uh, that we're spending that much less per person uh, than those other communities. Public works include both the highway, traditional public works, as well as uh, refuse disposal and solid waste. In that, we're spending, you know, we're, we're sort of in the middle. We're spending $194 per person we were a year, year ago. Uh, and you can see the range is from Scarborough at 308 to Brunswick at 129. Michael? Yes? On this chart, um, can you tell which communities uh, have gone to a pay per bag let's for solid to, waste? Let's, this one is specifically on solid waste. Uh, and you look at, you know, and again, this is per person, and this is both solid waste and recycling. We're spending 92, uh, Freeport and Gorham are considerably less friends or plus. You notice Falmouth is missing there. They, I did not have good data from Falmouth, but uh, Falmouth we know has a, you know, would be on the lower end of that based on, based on the program that they have. But, uh, you know, and there's another spreadsheet which you'll be getting for your September 11th workshop that really digs into the solid waste cost. We, we're now, we recycle amongst the eco-main communities in Greater Portland, the, the, the communities we usually compare as it doesn't include Westward, not an eco-main community, doesn't include Brunswick. Where we have recycled per person 14% more than the mean. So we're doing okay recycling. For solid waste, the stuff that's put in the hopper, we're 61% above the mean. We put 3.2 units in the hopper for every one unit we recycle. 3.2 pounds in the hopper 
for every one we recycle of all the, of the stuff that goes to eco main. This doesn't include the stuff that goes to the rest of the refuse disposal area. The, bal the, the mean for the communities is 2.3. Falmouth, which you, you mentioned Falmouth, is 1.19 to 1, their ratio. So Falmouth is almost recycling as much as they're putting in to, to the trash of eco main. And we have, so we have three times what Falmouth is doing in terms of how much we're putting in the hopper versus recycling as a ratio. So, and you can see, you know, some of these communities have residential pickup. And even without residential pickup, we're spending on, on the higher end per person for solid waste recycling. And the reason is we're 61% above the mean and, and eco main charges $160 a ton for that. The, the recycled is closer to $40 a ton if you really looked at all the expenses. So it's when you're, when you're that much above the mean, uh, that's, you know, and you look at, you know, you look at this, you know, Cape Elizabeth, uh, tax rates lower, some areas we're spending lower, and then, you know, we, well, you begin to say, where are we spending higher? This is, this is one of the areas. Any questions on that? Yeah. We, we, um, this is a very large percentage of our budget as well, right? It is, and Solid waste. the percentages in there is what we spend as a percentage of that versus the other communities. This is parks and community programs per person. And this, is, this does not include offsetting revenues. We are spending about 186 per person. Wyndham is spending $16 per person. Uh, you know, substantial difference. We are, you know, 70% more than the next nearest community in Freeport. Why is that? People look at that and say, oh, Parks, Fort Williams. Very little of that is Fort Williams. What that is primarily is community services, the pool and the pool. Lesser so the fitness center and the rest of the parks. But what, what's really hitting that and what throws it that much more than all the, the other communities uh, would be the pool and uh, uh, the uh, community services. In community services yeah. We have a very robust program. We do. And again, like South Portland's not listed there, that's because looking at their audit statement, I couldn't seem to find anything that made any sense that there was a comparable number. Ann? Mike, do you have a sense of what the offsetting revenues are for community services yeah. in the pool? Yeah, the, the offsetting revenues would probably, if you looked at, you know, I didn't, but the problem is I really don't know what the offsetting revenues are for all the other places. The this right. is just no, I, I understand. But our offsetting revenues are on community services are, are substantial. There's, you know, we, we fund about 150,000 of community services for about a million dollar budget. So there's, you know, you divide 850,000, that brings that down by 100. Just community services alone would bring the 185 cost down to 85. Okay. And then you add the pool revenues and that, we're probably in the, uh, 50, 50 range. However, this is just expenditures, doesn't include the revenues for the other communities. Okay? Uh, I think this is the last one. You know, we just had the presentation from the library. And we, we know that there's interests on land conservation, there's interests on, on uh, pathway along Shore Road, uh, there's some possible sewer work coming up. Uh, you know, there's, there's any number of issues. Uh, and this is where we stand with the other communities for debt. Cumberland is, uh, is up there at the top. In this case, we're, we're above the average. Uh, and you know, we, that's one reason we're at a cycle now, that we're looking for two or three years of not borrowing money uh, and, and paying down debt is in part to bring us down into the, the, the mid, mid, more middle range of this chart that you see. Anyway, that, that's the presentation. There's a lot more data in the actual handouts, but I think these give a a picture of the, the key points. I, I didn't put on designated surplus, Marianne. Uh, and, uh, you know, the library where we're in the middle to a little bit low. Uh, you know, some of the other areas, it, it's difficult to tell or to segregate because the communities don't segregate them as well. So, be happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Michael? I, I just have one question. I know we'll go into this later uh, next month. But, um, as we, as you pointed out, our solid waste dis disposal is very high. And that means we have a large percentage of solid waste, not, not only 
an amount, but a percentage-wise uh, for EcoMaine. Does that mean we also incur additional costs as we have greater utilization? Is it just the tipping fee, or are we paying more in terms of the debt and that sort of thing? If, if you look at the, the bullet points down below here, it's, as I mentioned, uh, it costs $160 per ton to place trash at EcoMaine, plus about $20 per ton in transportation costs. Uh, there is no charge to place, they don't charge for recyclables, but, you know, being generous, and it's probably a little bit high, it's $40 per ton for transportation and other costs. Therefore, for every ton of trash that is, that is instead recycled, we're saving $140 per ton. If Cape Elizabeth reduced trash to the mean level of 462 pounds per person, we're at 742. Wow. If we reduce to 462, the town would, would save, the town's taxpayers, would save $173,000 if all of the material, if it all got simply shifted to uh, recycling. If we also reduce trash to the mean, but that 20% 20, 20 of that was reduction and the 80% went to recycling, we'd save 100, about $183,000. Yeah. But you look at these numbers of, you know, we're, we're recycling 233 pounds per person. Scarborough's doing 338, but you know, overall we are at 14% of the mean. And notice these are weighted mean. That means it's not simply taking the means above and dividing, it's weighting it based on the population, so it's a, it's a more of a true number. This, uh, th these are our total annual tons. I think as long as you asked about recycling, you get a preview of some of the stuff the next month. Uh, last year, we reduced our tonnage going to EcoMaine by 10%. Uh, overall, these communities that go to EcoMaine and there's other communities, but these are the ones we usually compare ourselves to. Uh, they went, overall it went down 8.4%. Our, I need one more line up here so you can see the heading. Excuse me, Michael. Yeah? It says that Scarborough went down 22%. Yes, they went down 22%. What, do you have a sense of why? Did they, are they Curbside doing Curbside recycling. Differently? Curbside recycling. Okay. Recycled waste? Look at, look at Scarborough again, 46% increase in recycled waste last year. Wow. But, you know, look at Cape Elizabeth, 35%. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, a good job by the recycling committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, obviously a, good, a great job by the citizens. Uh, but, but overall, you know, you, you, look at, you look at us compared to Yarmouth, uh, Falmouth rather, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, they have twice as much recycled rate and it's, uh, their population is, uh, their population is more than ours. But, uh, but you look at, you know, you look at their ratio, uh, Falmouth is 1.2 and we're 3.2. Commercial waste, this shows the, the not so much business in Cape Elizabeth. We only had three tons last year. You look at Portland had 48,000 tons. Uh, but which means that we're paying for all the commercial waste and it's being classified as residential. Uh, that's the... You look overall, if you add residential, recycling, commercial, last year we went down 2% where, the, where these regional communities went down 6%. Hmm. Did I answer your question and then some, Paul? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And this sheet isn't available online yet, but uh, it's something we, we're prepared in advance of the, uh, your workshop on September 11th. And this, Michael, that's right. Could, I'm sorry. Could you... Could you pull your exhibit over to the side? The bottom part showed it was that three, how many pounds? The ratio? Yeah, the ratio. Could, yeah. could we just see that? So three point. We're at 3.2. 3.2 pounds. Yeah. South Portland's at 3.6. Standish at 5.2. Yarmouth's at 3.5. Okay, great. And you said we will be able to get this information. I can email it to anyone anytime, but... Uh, this is the subject of the September, work, 11th, September 11th workshop, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's certainly available beforehand, but we'll get into it in even greater... I, I think as long as we can get it a little before the workshop, that would be very helpful just to be able to look at it to prepare for the workshop. I'll email it to you tomorrow, and then Great. I'll Thank you. send it to Wendy, and we'll put it with probably under documents on the website. That's it. Thank you. Manager Mike. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> no, thank you, Mike. I, uh, 
I know that putting those benchmarks together is a lot of work every, every year. Um, and I know sometimes you've talked about maybe doing it on an every other year basis, but I believe strongly in managing um, by the metrics and evaluating how you're doing compared to others. And so, I, again, I know it's a lot of work, but I, I think I can sp safely speak for the rest of the council in saying how much we appreciate that work and value that work. So we thank you for your efforts in putting those numbers together. OK. Um, the next item is uh, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If there is anyone here who would like to speak to anything that was not on our agenda, um, now is the time. And seeing none, before we have a motion to adjourn, I will just announce again that we will have a public hearing um, and town council vote on the school budget next Monday, August 18th at uh, 7.30 here in this chamber. Um, I'll just mention to the uh, town council that you are all invited to the annual employee, that's the Municipal Employee Recognition Luncheon, which is August 20th, and you should RSVP to uh, Deborah Lane. Uh, the next town council meeting is September 8th, at, two, uh, at 7.30 here, and then we do have a workshop on the recycling and solid waste issues, which um, Michael just hinted about on September 11th. So with that, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. All in favor? 5-0. Thank you. I think everything we did tonight was unanimous. <laughs> Thank you.